It's my honor to introduce Professor Christopher Walsh. Christopher did his combined MD and PhD at the University of Chicago. And after graduating from the Chicago, he took up a residency in neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital. His first faculty position was in 1993 at Beth um, Hospital, uh, where he was studying mechanism that guide pattern of proliferation and migration of cells. Currently, he's chief of division of genetics and genomics at Harvard and with his colleagues running the Allen Center for Human Brain Evolution. But um, he continued to see patients each year in the general clinic in neurology. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Walsh. Thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. I just want to make sure I'm hooked up here. Marvelous. So thank you again. Uh, and I just want to thank um, the Kavali Committee for uh, this tremendous honor of sharing this with, uh, with Huda and Harry and Jean-Louis uh, and for bringing us here. I want to thank IHEC and all of the other people who made all the arrangements to make it a great week. Uh, and of course, you know, what I'm going to tell you about is the work of all the people that have come through my lab. Uh, which I will not have uh, time in this short talk to adequately recognize, uh, but it's really been them that, that drive the work. Um, and um, also the work of many collaborators. And I just want to also thank um, Boston Children's Hospital, the Beth Israel Deaconess, uh, and Harvard Medical School, uh, and several funding organizations, uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the NIH, uh, the uh, Simons Foundation, and also the uh, Paul Allen Frontiers Program for the support they've given us over the years. So, um, so I think like a lot of neuroscientists, I've always been fascinated by how, uh, oh, and also I want to thank my family. Uh, this is my mom, uh, dressed in traditional Norwegian, I believe that's traditional Norwegian uh, garb. Um, it's working marvelous. Uh, and I want, so I want to thank my uh, family, both of my parents, uh, also my seven siblings, uh, and my um, wife uh, and collaborator, Dr. Ming-Wei Chen, and our beautiful daughters who really uh, are the light of our lives. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, I think a lot of us in neuroscience are fascinated by this concept that a, a bunch of undistinguished cells sometime, somehow become the instrument of consciousness and creativity and the scientific method. Uh, and so that's what I've always been fascinated about, how these progenitor cells, which are shown here in green, uh, make post-mitotic neurons. And the progenitor cells are, are, uh, have their cell bodies along the inner lining of the brain. Is there a pointer on this, or is there a pointer somewhere? Or, uh, uh, I, I'll just skip the pointer. Uh, and they make these neurons, uh, shown here uh, in sort of shades of yellow, that then migrate up to the cerebral cortex. And the cortex is a layered structure with six layers. And uh, it's these deepest layers, neurons, that are actually born first. And then the upper layer neurons are constantly uh, migrating uh, past them uh, to form the very upper layers of the cortex. And so actually, as a student and as a postdoctoral fellow, uh, I was studying these, gen describing really these general processes and very interested uh, in trying to get at some of the mechanisms of uh, what actually makes that work. And so in the first half of my talk, I'll tell you a little bit about how genetic differences between individuals, both inherited differences and also spontaneous, non-inherited but genetic uh, changes, can illuminate uh, mechanisms at every stage of this process, from the stage of proliferation uh, to the stage of migration and differentiation. And then in the second half of the talk, I'll actually uh, describe, give you a glimpse of what we understand about the tremendous genetic diversity that lies within each of us. Uh, that each of us actually contain multitudes and that every cell uh, in our body has a unique genome that marks its development uh, that, and also uh, marks processes that occur during aging. So, um, having described some of these patterns of development, uh, it really, my uh, transition to being a human geneticist occurred on a single day, and that day was in May of 1993 when uh, Mingwei and I went to a meeting in Venice uh, where there was a presentation by uh, one of my uh, mentors in pediatric neurology, P Peter Huttenlocker, uh, and he presented uh, patients in this remarkable family, uh, 
uh, that have these blobs of neurons that uh, are formed normally, but never migrate out of the ventricular zone. And these patients, he had already showed that the patients are generally female, and the condition is inherited from mother to daughter. And so he had already suggested that it was on the X chromosome and that the females are mosaics a mixture of lucky and unlucky neurons, the lucky ones using their good X chromosome and migrating normally, and the unlucky ones uh, lacking uh, the gene product and being unable to migrate. So on that day, uh, Peter and his wife Janellen and Mingwei and I all had lunch together on Murano and decided to collaborate to try to identify that gene. And by the time we actually identified that gene, five years later, in 1998, we had already identified in our lab another gene for a different sort of neuronal migration disorder that we initially thought might have been the same condition because it's also X-linked. Uh, and females are mosaics again. But this time, the neurons migrate halfway to the cortex. They leave the ventricular zone. They migrate out into the intermediate zone and then stop seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and uh, so this forms what's commonly referred to as a double cortex, a band of neurons stuck underneath uh, the normal cerebral cortex, and these patients typically have a terrible intractable epilepsy. This turned out to actually be a distinct gene on a different part of the X chromosome, uh, and this was also identified uh, in 1998. And so this, uh, these projects enlightened me to the tremendous power that uh, genetics provided to be able to study the mechanisms in so many uh, steps of cortical development. And so that's been sort of an obsession ever since. And so over the, uh, or now several decades, we've identified dozens of genes that disrupt um, various steps of this process. And um, really, we've benefited tremendously by collaborating with clinicians, particularly in parts of the world where marriage between distant relatives is common, because as you can see, many of these disorders are inherited recessively. Those highlighted in red are recessive. And it's these recessive mutations which are the most common uh, manner in which these developmental mutations act. And that's familiar to all of us from worm knockouts or fly knockouts or mouse knockouts that are typically simple recessives. And the same is generally true of these severe developmental disorders of, in humans, that these recessive mutations actually account for much of the diversity of the genetics. Uh, and so uh, capturing that diversity gives us the greatest insight into mechanism. So just to illustrate a few examples of the sorts of insights that we can gain by doing this genetics, uh, we and others st have studied uh, conditions associated with microcephaly. And so this is a human brain which is reduced in size, uh, in this case about a third of the normal size. So it's a human brain reduced to the size of a chimpanzee's brain, and you can see the resultant uh, simplification of the gyral pattern. And uh, so actually now about a dozen genes have been identified by our lab and others for uh, this sort of non-syndromic or simple microcephaly. And they form these remarkable complexes of proteins. There's a, co a protein complex in the centrosome itself, indicated here schematically in red. And then this remarkable pericentrosomal complex that focuses around the maternal centriole, as you can see with these two different microcephaly genes, WDR62 and ASPM, where they're both highlighted in red immunoreactivity uh, surrounding one of the two, pre predominantly one of the two centrioles. So these genes actually have essential roles in stem cell renewal. In fact, their uh, essential role seems to involve linking of the uh, of the mitotic spindle apparatus to uh, proteins that line the ventricular surface, shown here um, in, um, in red and shown uh, here in an actual photomicrograph. So these are their apical proteins lining the ventricle, actually shown here in green in the case of RL13B. And then the centrioles are highlighted in red by gamma tubulin. And, um, WDR62 and ASPM and several other microcephaly proteins actually link the centriole to the apical complex proteins. And so in the absence of these proteins, in this case WDR, in the presence of them, in fact, wherever you see a red spot, you see a green spot, uh, and that's what's highlighted by these white arrows. I hope that that reproduces well. And in the absence, in this case of WDR62, you see green spots without red or red spots without green. You occasionally see them together, but in fact, the um, spindle apparatus, and the apical complex proteins are no longer so tightly linked. And these apical complex proteins are proteins that critically regulate stem cell renewal, 
And we had shown that by showing that if you overexpress uh, some of these apical proteins, in this case an activated form of beta catenin, you can take a small mouse brain and turn it into this huge mouse brain that starts to form its own, some, uh, some sort of gyration. Or if you remove these proteins, you actually can uh, completely obliterate the cerebral cortex of a mouse. And so um, this, the, the microcephaly complex then connects these two, the centrioles and the apical complex proteins and controls the inheritance of these apical complex proteins. And in turn, that controls the size that the cortex ends up being. And remarkably, uh, several of these microcephaly proteins we have shown and others, notably ASPM, uh, show in their primary sequence and in their overall structure, very strong evidence that they're targets of evolutionary selection on the lineage uh, leading to humans, that they show an excess of missense amino acid changes, suggesting that it is this mechanism uh, that is used um, by nature to control the size of the brain uh, in different species. So then after proliferation, as I mentioned, the neurons have to migrate from down here uh, up to the cerebral cortex. And again, uh, human genetics has um, given us genes that involve every step of this process and allowed us to subdivide this process of neuronal migration into something which is not generic but is extremely specific. And so not only filament A, but actually several other genes uh, described in our lab also cause neurons to arrest along the ventricle. Also RFGEF2 and LRP2. And these proteins all seem to share a role in actually uh, building and maintaining this ventricular lining. Double cortin is, is not the only gene that causes neurons to migrate halfway to the cortex and then stop in the middle of nowhere. Uh, other genes described by uh, our lab, dynein C1H1, CEP85L, and uh, genes described by other labs, notably, notably Jamal Shelley in Paris, also have a very similar disruption in the pattern of neuronal migration. And in fact, also all focus on a common molecular function of the control of microtubule transport uh, in neurons. Uh, then there are disorders where neurons actually successfully migrate all the way to the cortex, but then once they get there, they go to exactly the wrong layer. So that neurons that belong at the bottom end up at the top, neurons that belong at the top end up on the bottom. Uh, and uh, we, uh, the first gene uh, that was essential for this process was first uh, described in mice. It's uh, responsible for the realer mouse. Uh, and then we identified the human uh, ortholog of that, mutations in real and in humans, that causes uh, this particular sort of, again, simplification of the gyri due to this abnormal migration. And subsequently, other labs have identified a couple of other genes, the VLDL receptor and CDK5, that also seem to have similar phenotypes in humans and similar mechanisms in this controlling this migration. And then there are neuronal migration disorders where neuron, neuronal migration is all too effective. And the neurons migrate to the cortex and keep right on going, right past the cortex, and actually burst right out of the brain. And they make holes in the brain like this. Here's the peel surface, and here's this explosion of neurons like lava going out of the brain and into forming a tangled mass in the subarachnoid space. Uh, and there are a number of genes that have been de described by our lab and others. And again, these all seem to have a common function in building and maintaining the basement membrane, uh, specifically regulating uh, alpha dystroglycan function. What am I doing on time here? Let's see. Uh, all right. And so, um, so as, I, as I told you, there's this tremendous ability of human genetics to be used in a forward-looking way to identify really mechanisms of whatever process we're interested in. And that's, of course, so nicely illustrated by Ardem's talk uh, this morning. Uh, and this is something which is now commonly used. So now in the second half of the talk, I'll turn to uh, understanding this uh, diversity within us all. Uh, and we started uh, our own interest uh, in this area, uh, again, from the point of view of human genetics, studying a specific disorder that uh, disrupts just half of the brain, uh, but not the entire brain. And this has an unpronounceable Greek name called hemimegalencephaly, for uh, hemi meaning half, mega meaning large, and cephaly referring to the cortex. And so here you see this condition, uh, where in this case the right 
brain, which is shown on the left side of the picture, because that's how the radiologists like to sort of keep us confused, uh, is much larger than the normal left hemisphere. Uh, and it's also, perhaps you can see, it's also uh, quite disorganized. And so uh, this actually uh, is a, in this particular patient uh, was born and from the day of birth essentially had about 100 seizures a day. The seizures were completely intractable. And so in a desperate attempt to control his epilepsy, surgeons removed his entire right hemisphere, right down to the thalamus. And so this bright white stuff you see here is just cerebrospinal fluid. And uh, remarkably, this was life-saving. Uh, he had no seizures at all for six years. He learned to walk, he speaks fluently, he reads at grade level. Uh, and as you can see, he's still uh, weak in his left arm, as you might expect from the right hemisphere, but uh, his life was basically saved and salvaged by this uh, dramatic uh, surgery. And it was only that surgery that actually allowed us to get at the genetic cause of his uh, hemispheric overgrowth, because he carries a mutation in that abnormal right brain, but as far as we know, that's the only place where the mutation lives, because it is a, and that's how we describe a somatic mutation, which soma meaning body. So these are mutations that are present in the body, but not typically present in the germline. And they're not typically present in the germline because mutations are so toxic that they would kill an embryo because of some massive deformity or defect of early development. And so uh, his mutation actually is absent from the blood, which is the only other tissue of his that we had available to study. And so he has a mosaic mutation. It's a mutation, as far as we know, limited to that right hemisphere. And it's actually not even present in all of the cells of that right hemisphere. It's only present in somewhere, uh, typical patients between 10 and 30% of the cells in the bad hemisphere. Uh, and no, as far as we know, nowhere else. Now, hemimegalencephaly is quite rare. Uh, however, it has a cousin condition called focal cortical dysplasia where the malformation is very tiny and there's only one or two gyri in size, maybe one or two centimeters. Uh, and in fact, these are, uh, and actually, sorry, this shows uh, what that boy's mutation looks like. This is a gain of function missense mutation in an oncogene called AKT3. And you see that this little Sanger trace looks normal in the leukocytes. And then in the brain, you see this little side band, which is the uh, mutation, again, present in only uh, about a third of the cells. But anyway, and these, these mutations, these, these disorders are even more remarkable. Uh, we get to study them again because they're intensely epileptic, uh, and any busy neurosurgical service removes them um, from children in order to uh, treat the epilepsy. Uh, and so again, we can study the condition by, only by studying the tissue. And here, we can find mutations in the same pathway, the mTOR pathway, but now the mutations are only present in somewhere between 1 and 5% of the cells within the lesion. And we see gain-of-function mutations in essentially all up and down the pathway, PI3 kinase. Uh, we see loss of P10, which is a negative regulator, gain of AKT3, loss of tuberous sclerosis, which is a negative regulator, gain of mTOR itself, loss of DEPDC5, and other which are all negative regulators. And so these have a common theme of gain of function of the mTOR pathway. Uh, and in fact, the discovery of this has been very useful because mTOR inhibitors are already used as anti-cancer therapies, and they've already been adapted now to treat these lesions. Those children that are not uh, candidates for surgery because their particular lesion might involve their language area, uh, and so it might not be easily removable, uh, can be uh, treated and improved somewhat, imp uh, not perfectly, but somewhat with these mTOR inhibitors. And so uh, these actually, these smaller lesions, which are called focal cortical dysplasia, as I mentioned, they're not terribly rare. Uh, any busy pediatric neurosurgery service uh, treats them all the time. In fact, they are the most common cause of intractable epilepsy in children that results uh, in neurosurgery to treat it. And that's also because they respond uh, so, uh, so well, uh, by and large, to surgery. And this, again, shows you what they look like. They look like these little pizza slices going right down sometimes to the ventricular zone. So uh, you can see uh, how they their appearance strongly suggests that they represent that the, uh, a mutation occurring uh, actually in one of these progenitor cells and giving rise to a clone of cells in the overlying cortex.
Now, uh, recent work that's not yet published, uh, but has been submitted, we've been looking at uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, which is the most common cause of intractable epilepsy in adults uh, that ends up resulting in neurosurgical therapy. And surgery for temporal lobe epilepsy is now more than a century old, and probably, in fact, goes back to the ancients who often trephinated the brains of people, uh, the skulls of people, to try to release the evil spirits. And recently, we've made a fascinating discovery that, in fact, uh, some cases of intractable adult human temporal lobe epilepsy have um, gain-of-function mutations, not in the mTOR pathway, but in the RAS pathway. So a different, and, and in, this includes patients that have no other obvious lesions, but they just have uh, intractable epilepsy in the temporal lobe, and remarkably, uh, some of these are actually limited to the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, uh, suggesting the possibility that the late neurogenesis that characterizes the dentate gyrus might contribute to the formation or the, exp or the expansion of these uh, mosaic mutations uh, in the temporal lobe. Now, I'll just summarize briefly uh, uh, a whole series of studies that where we've been trying to understand other disorders that might be caused uh, by these mosaic mutations. Uh, we've been particularly interested in neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, autism and schizophrenia. We have recent papers either published or submitted on both of those conditions. We had a paper five years ago that suggested that mosaic point mutations um, contribute to perhaps 5% of autism spectrum disorders, and, seven, and uh, three other groups had similar papers at the same time. And that's particularly fascinating. We found in our group that, in fact, um, our patients, those that had these mosaic mutations, tended to be higher functioning than those that had germline, identifiable germline autism mutations. And so this um, suggests the intriguing possibility that perhaps those um, mosaic mutations have that higher functioning because they almost act like uh, some of these epilepsy mutations, as though the child might have a mutation in part of their brain, but not all of their brain, allowing them to be very good at some things uh, and very poor at social behavior. We studied mosaic copy number variants, which uh, in the germline contribute to about 5 or 7% of, of autism, and we found that they have a, a minor, a small, but consistent contribution to a fraction of a percent of autism uh, spectrum disorder cases. Uh, but uh, we had a paper about a year ago finding that actually somatic mutations in non-coding regions are particularly enriched in the autism brain. So that with a very small sample size of just like 60 autism brains, we found that there was an excess of these mutations. And we don't really know what their contribution to disease risk is, but it's amazing that we see this uh, tremendous enrichment uh, in, the, in the neuronal enhancers in, in autism brain. We've more recently, we have papers on MedArchive and BioArchive studying mosaic copy number variants, uh, which contribute to about one out of 200 cases of schizophrenia. Uh, and we find uh, in a paper which is on BioArchive, again, that uh, a significant fraction of schizophrenic brains have a very distinctive, very peculiar recurrent pattern of um, non-coding mutation, particularly enriched at transcription factor binding sites. Uh, and uh, it appears that this has a contribution to risk. Uh, and we don't know yet what causes it, uh, but, we, but uh, we think it could be very important in terms of understanding both its cause as well as its contribution to risk. So this uh, apparent role of these developmental mutations got us very interested in understanding just what is the extent of this genomic diversity between cells uh, in the brain. Uh, and so two students, Gilad Avroni and Shu Yu Kai, developed a method to take single neurons, typically from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and separate uh, neuronal nuclei and then amplify the whole genome uh, using originally a method called multiple displacement amplification and then sequence the genome of one neuron and compare it to the genome of the neuron next to it. And so uh, we, looked, we, we looked initially at uh, line element insertions, which happen, but which are fairly rare. We've looked at copy number variants. But the most interesting aspect of this genomic diversity has to do with simple substitutions of one base pair to another when you compare the genome of two neurons. And in terms of development, we find that there are two or three of these um, single nucleotide variants seemingly with every cell division that we could plot the first four or so cell divisions, and it looks like there's about three to four in the first cell division, and then two to three in the later ones. Uh, and so this suggests that almost essentially every cell division of our, that makes our body is marked 
by these mutations. And these mutations are lineage marks. And so that, in fact, each of us has a forensic lineage map of the entire development of our body that's inscribed in these somatic mutations. And so also, this gives, about, uh, this gives an average of about 80 of these mosaic mutations just in the first five cell divisions. And as, um, as Jean-Louis mentioned in the video, which I've seen so many times now, there are about 60 or 80 de novo mutations in our germline relative to our parents. So the first five cell divisions generate a genetic diversity almost equivalent to that which occurs with each generation. And this means that a typical person, an average one of us, has a, an average of a, like about one a function altering exonic mutation uh, in, the first, in these first five uh, cell divisions. So again, these mutations can occur throughout the genome. Most of them are functionally silent and are only lineage marks. And, about a, couple, and a couple of percent of them occur in exons uh, and so are likely to be function altering. And so, uh, we have then tried to figure out how far can we go with this developmental lineage map? What can we learn about the development of the unique development of each one of us by studying these uh, developmental barcodes? Uh, and so one, as one example, uh, we found that, in fact, the early development of no two people is the same. Uh, some people, when we can track using these mutations, we can identify retrospectively the two cell stage and the four cell stage. Uh, and in fact, here, here are the early lineage trees of two different people. And in this person, the, two, the first two cells contribute very equally to the ultimate cells of the embryo, whereas this person has a very unequal contribution. We found that this inequality ranges all the way from 90 to 10 to 50-50. Uh, and there's no uh, determinant, determinism to that uh, division. Um, and uh, so then these barcodes actually brought me back to my postdoctoral fellowship, which I did with Connie Sepko, because Connie had developed the first retroviral vectors to do lineage mapping in animal models. She uh, developed laxi encoding retinal uh, laxity encoding retroviruses that can label clones of cells. And here's an example that she published in the retina where you see a family of cells that are so tightly packed you can't even resolve where one cell ends and the next begins. And so my postdoc project was to apply this to the cerebral cortex. And I quickly found that the clones behaved totally differently, that they dispersed very widely in the cortex. And so we developed uh, barcodes to, to use not one virus, but a hundred or a thousand different viruses, and then amplify the cells one at a time to figure out which belonged to which clone based on the barcode. Uh, and so that way we could identify the clones regardless of where the cells migrated. And uh, so we found that, in fact, some clones covered the entire cortex, other clones, clones formed uh, clusters. And so how do humans behave? So humans, again, how does this lineage map that we can define in humans compare? And again, these barcodes in humans are even better than um, retroviral barcodes because in humans, we are marking essentially every cell division. And, uh, so here's an example where about 100 different cells, each represented as a point on the outside of the circle, can be separated into different families. Uh, by mutations that are shared here, the purple ones define one and the blue another and so on. Uh, and we find that a given patch of the cortex has a contribution from uh, multiple different cells that are traceable all the way back to the early blastocyst. So the pink cells are more closely related to cells in the heart than they are to the blue cells that are next door to them. Or looking within a branch, uh, the early mutation is distributed all across the brain, and the late mutation is restricted to small parts of the brain. And we can also demonstrate this inside-out sequence of development in the cortex in humans, because we find that uh, within this branch, the late mutations are present only in the upper layers, uh, and that's because the uh, lower layers are already post-mitotic. But the most fascinating part of this genomic diversity is what happens after the neurons have stopped dividing. Uh, because we found that remarkably, neurons continue to add mutations at a rate of about 20 mutations per year throughout life, and in a, in a fashion which is extremely linear. Uh, and so we described this four or five years ago, but the methods were not perfect and it seemed very noisy. And just recently, we have a paper on bioarchiving coming out in Nature Genetics where we repeat it with a much better method called primary template amplification. And you can see there's an, this incredible precision to the addition of, in this case, 17 or 18 substitution mutations per year. 
and a paper, two other recent papers from Sunny Shi and from um, Inigo Martin Carena using two completely different methods, one using transposases, another using duplex sequencing. You see that you put these three, I take the liberty of taking their data and put it on the same plot, and you can see that they all line up almost precisely. Uh, and so we have this timer in the genome of our non-dividing neurons, which marks time and adds another mutation every two or three weeks throughout life. And we add the same exact number of mutations in the first year of life as we do in the last year of life uh, in the normal brain. And we also add uh, two or three insertion or deletion mutations, so where you uh, insert a couple of base pairs or delete a couple of base pairs, typically because of abnormally repaired double-stranded breaks. And both of these mutational types are, are, are enriched uh, paradoxically and somewhat unfortunately, just in those genes that show the highest level of expression in brain. And so we think that transcription has a lot to do with causing these mutations. Uh, and they're very enriched in promoters and in enhancers, of neuro particularly in neuronal promoters and neuronal enhancers. Uh, and particularly these, uh, double, these insertion deletions are uh, enriched in enhancers and promoters and open chromatin. And so again, it's just the genes that are most important that are those that are most likely to get mutated. And so that's what happens in the normal brain. What happens, does this have a role in abnormal aging or abnormal neurodegeneration? Uh, the answer appears to be, uh, it certainly seems to be involved. We've looked at rare genetic disorders, Cocaine syndrome and xeroderma pigmentosa, where there is early death from n severe neurodegeneration, so that typically these patients lose 50 or 60 years of life due to their early death. And you can see that the number of mutations is increased so that they die uh, with a number of mutations that would be more typical of an 80-year-old, even though they're dying when they're 10 or 12 years old. More recently, we just published work data on Alzheimer's disease, where we also see an increase in these mutations, now more modest, because the loss of life in Alzheimer's disease is only about uh, nine or 10 years of life. And in work that's unpublished, we've looked at chronic traumatic encephalopathy from football players, uh, and uh, find that there the enrichment is even greater. So just to conclude, rare genetic disorders disrupt every step in brain development, every gene, uh, Probably every base pair in our genome is mutated in someone somewhere, and they present, um, and those present in some but not all cells uh, represent this permanent map uh, and create this, a risk for a variety of different diseases. Uh, and then finally, the neuronal genome is some sort of tablet that records everything that the neuron goes through. It records its development, it records its age, and it records environmental or disease-related factors to which it is exposed. And so I just want to stop by somehow acknowledging all the tremendous people that I've had through my lab. I want to highlight my critical collaborators, Peter Park and Alice Lee, for all of the single cell work, a couple of people in my lab that have been with me for a very long time, several of my mentors, and again, my family, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Christopher. We have time for a few questions. This was really fascinating. This was really fascinating, Chris. Um, it, it looks like we're rolling the dice all the time as humans as we grow. Um, how is this true? I mean, for humans, we have long lifespan. We can generate lots of offsprings, if possible, of course. Uh, how, how does it correlate with the lifespan of animals, this type of mutation rate? I imagine those animals that live long enough, they can roll the dice. I guess these mutations are also not just in brain, but in other cells, like including the gametes as well. So does it correlate with anything in the animal kingdom, these mutation rates? That's a terrific question. Uh, and so we have not, we've been wanting to study that in the brain by studying mice and naked mole rats and so forth. Uh, but um, we, uh, so we haven't gotten to that yet, but um, it has been done actually in a fascinating study recently published by uh, Inigo Martin Carena uh, in Nature. Uh, he studied it in the gut. And so like the neurons, so neurons are like 20 mutations a year, so they're like 1,600 when you're 80 years old, uh, plus those that you're born with, another 100 or so you're born with. Um, the gut accumulates mutations at a fairly similar rate, a little bit faster, and so people generally die with about 3,000 mutations per genome per cell in the gut. Uh, 
Uh, and so there's something about this couple of thousand mutations that, that is fairly common to many different, the normal lung, also we generally die with about 3,000 mutations per genome in the normal lung. And so, and the gut uh, uh, mutates a little faster because the cells divide. And that additional difference, uh, you can tell by the pattern of mutations that they're cell division related mutations, not these non-cell division related mutations, which also have their own distinctive nucleotide profile. Anyway, so they studied a zoo of animals, 23 different species, including elephants and whales, uh, naked mole rats, to be sure, mice and rats. And basically, all animals die with 3,000 mutations per genome, plus or minus something like 500 to 1,000. It doesn't, uh, and so those that live for a short period of time accumulate the mutations very quickly. Uh, those which live a long time, longer than us, accumulate them even slower. It doesn't matter how big you are. So, you know, elephants are much, much bigger, but accumulate mutation, but have the same lifespan as humans, more or less, or a little shorter, and so they accumulate. Them. And so that's consistent with the idea that this accumulation of mutations is what, I, is what actually defines lifespan. We don't, can't prove that. And the, because the thing about these mutations is they create disease. You know, dividing mutations is what, mutations and dividing cells is what creates cancer. Uh, and so we think that it may be that these mutations in non-dividing cells might be what essentially, you know, uh, by, by the time we're 80, most of us will have a dozen or more function-altering altering, function altering mutations in, 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 in genes expressed in the brain. Uh, and so that's, that seems to be okay if you're normal, but anything that makes that a little worse seems to be a problem. If there are no more questions. So we will move on to the, and please join me to thank Professor Christopher Walsh again. Thank you.